Hi friends, welcome to Plexus Ortho. My name is Dr. Kanan Kumar and today we are going to discuss the neat PG questions that were asked a couple of days ago. So according to the students, it was a fairly uh, okay exam. So therefore let us go through the questions So because uh, it becomes important for you to understand the answers and it becomes very important for the FMGE and the uh, upcoming INICT exams as well. So let's go through one of these, uh, all these questions one by one. So the first question was, a 12 year old girl presented with uh, a peripheral smear shown in the picture, right? So what does the peripheral smear show? It shows sickling of the red blood cells. So it's a very clear case of sickle cell anemia, right? It's a very clear case of sickle cell anemia. So this is a spotter. You have to pick it from the, pick it up from the, uh, uh, the picture. And then they further ask, she developed sudden pain and tenderness in her upper tibia region. What organism is most likely to be responsible for this? So in all probability, this indicates towards an osteomyelitis. So all of us have seen in previous videos and we have discussed and we all know that osteomyelitis occurs in children very commonly around the knee region and around the knee, the most common location is upper tibial region. There are two or three reasons why the upper tibia or the metaphyseal region has osteomyelitis. All of you know this. Reason number one is the blood vessels make a loop formation there. Therefore, the blood becomes more sluggish, right? Reason number two, the oxygen tension is decreased here in this location and therefore there is it allows for seeding of bacteria. And reason number three is that phagocytic activity is enhanced in this metaphyseal region. So these are the reasons why osteomyelitis occurs in the metaphyseal region, right? So they are asking what organism would be responsible for this. If this I would consider a googly question. I You have to think very carefully about this question. All of us know that the most likely organism that causes osteomyelitis in the body is staphylococcus without any doubt the one of the second or the one of the more common organisms in case of sickle cell anemia all of us know is salmonella but in spite of salmonella being associated with sickle cell disease the number one cause of osteomyelitis even in case of a sickle cell disease i believe is staphylococcus so i would osteomyelitis and uh, organism, I would always stick on Staphylococcus. It doesn't matter what the patient condition is. If Staphylococcus is one of the options in the MCQ question. If Staphylococcus is not an option and definitely then I would have gone for Salmonella. So the answer here I would go is for staph Staphylococcus. And I'm very clear why Staphylococcus is the answer. I've been, I've discussed this in previous videos as well. There's a basic doubt all students have. We are not sure what the examiner is thinking, but I clearly do know that Staphylococcus is the one which is associated with osteomyelitis most commonly and therefore Staph aureus is the first answer that should come to your mind and not Salmonella in this case and this is what I believe and that's what I have discussed with a lot of other examiners and that's what I feel is the right answer for this question. So let's go back to the question and see Salmonella as all of us know is associated with sickle cell disease. All of us know that Pseudomonas is associated with IV drug users. Remember that. Pseudomonas is, uh, is associated with IV drug users. Fungal infection is associated with HIV patients. So these things you must be very clear about. A patient came to the ER with a Galeazi fracture. Soft tissue swelling, swelling was seen on the x-ray. And what is the management in the emergency department? So there are a few things that you have to mark in this question. The first thing is the patient presented to the ER, not to the clinic, and patient presented with a Galeazi fracture. And what is the management in the emergency department? They are not asking for your definitive management. They are not asking definitive management. They are asking. So this is not what they're asking. They're asking for what will you do in the emergency condition in the ER, right? So what is a Galeazi fracture? We let us go through what is a Galeazi fracture. Galeazi fracture is a distal third fracture of the radius with dislocation of the DRUJ. So Galeazi fracture and Montegia fracture. This is a picture of a Montegia fracture. Montegia fracture is proximal third ulna and proximal radial ulnar joint or radial head dislocation. So Galeazi fracture is distal radius whereas Montegia is proximal ulna. Galeazi is dislocation of the DRUJ. Mont Montegia fracture is dislocation of the proximal radial ulnar joint that is basically the radial head. Okay, what is the classification system used for Montegia? Basically, it is bad dose classification. Remember, these are the few points that you have to remember about Galeazi and Montegia fracture. Very commonly asked in your exams, asked every other year, so you must know these, know these very well. So what do you do in these cases in the emergency? Make sure you reduce the dislocation. You gently reduce the dislocation in the ER and put a slab. 
So what do you have to do? You have to check for vascularity before you do the close reduction in any uh, uh, dislocation or fracture reduction case. Then do a close reduction. Then you have to check your vascularity again. Once you do a close reduction, always check the vascularity again. Then apply a POP cast or a slab. So the first option is the correct option for Galizia fracture or Montegia fracture for that matter. Galizia or Montegia fracture management or any dislocation management in the ER. First check vascularity and neurovascular status. Do a close reduction. Check vascularity and neurovascular status again. And then do a POP cast or slab application. The definitive management of this is an open reduction internal fixation of the radius fracture. You place a 3 point or you fix a 3.5 mm DCP plate. 3.5 mm DCP plate is used to fix the radius and the DRUJ or dislocation is also corrected. You should check vascularity uh, correct, close reduction is correct but X fix is wrong. So this option is wrong. Check vascularity but do close reduction again you have to check vascularity before you apply POP slab. So this option is also wrong and the first option is the correct option. I hope you have understood the gist of what this question is, um, question is trying to ask you and hopefully you get the correct answer. So let's go to the next question. Which of the following conditions cause intermittent fractures of the uh, bones in a child? That means which of the which of the following conditions causes repeated fractures in the bones? All of us know this is a straightforward question. It's a spotter. It is osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a defect in the collagen 1. Collagen 1 defect formation. It can be autosomal recessive. It can be autosomal dominant. Right? And it has a triad of symptoms which we will discuss. It has a triad of symptoms. Okay, you must all remember that bone is type 1 collagen. 1 is there in the bone in the bone in the word bone, so it is type 1 collagen. Cartilage is type 2 collagen. Remember this because this has been asked very often. So other conditions like achondroplasia will cause dwarfism, right? And uh, the FGFR3 gene is involved. Fibroblast growth factor receptor gene uh, 3 is involved. That is FGFR3 is involved in like achondroplasia. Marfan syndrome is associated with um, uh, hyperelasticity. It is associated with aortic uh, dilatation, uh, the lens dislocation from the eyes and these are the various pro problems with uh, Marfan syndrome. Right? Then you have cretinism. Cretinism is basically hypothyroidism in infants or in, in the neonatal age group can cause cretinism. So the answer to this question is osteogenesis imperfecta. All of us know osteogenesis imperfecta is also called as brittle bone disease. It is a mutation in collagen type 1. Type 1 uh, collagen mutation occurs, can be autosomal dominant and recessive. There are various forms of osteogenesis imperfecta from a mild variety to a severe variety. So what are the what is the triad they have? They have hearing loss number 1, they have blue sclera number 2 and the third part of the triad is num multiple fractures. Multiple fractures is the third part of the triad. So the triad of osteogenesis imperfecta is multiple fractures, blue sclera and hearing loss. Okay, So that is about that question. Now next they asked a question uh, like this. They asked identify the following picture and in which condition is this procedure done they have asked. So basically this is an external fixator. All of you should be able to recognize this external fixator. You can see that there are pins in the tibia, there are pins in the femur as well. Whenever you cross a joint it is calling, called a spanning external fixator. right? So this is the hip joint here for the patient. This is a knee joint and this is the ankle joint. So the external fixator has crossed the knee joint and therefore it is called as a spanning external fixator. If the external fixator crosses the ankle, then it is called a spanning external fixator of the ankle. So when do you use a spanning external fixator? Spanning external fixator is used in fractures of the, it is used in fractures of the, it is used in fractures of the uh, periarticular fractures around the knee. So distal femur or proximal third uh, tibia fractures, open fractures where you cannot implant inside or when there is a dislocation or a highly unstable knee joint, then you use a spanning fixator. Same with the ankle, same with the elbow where you span uh, above and below the joint. So periarticular around the joint, uh, whatever fracture happens should be fixed with a spanning external fixator. So that is called as a periarticular spanning external fixator. That is the correct answer. Let us look at the other options. Tibial fracture does not need a spanning fixator. So if you have a tibial shaft fracture here, you just put two pins above and two pins below. So you keep the fixator in the knee, in the tibial joint. 
tibial fracture illusoro ring fixator this is not an illusoro ring fixator this is an external fixator with shan spins and connecting rods if you have a ring like fixator around whole of the knee or whole of the uh, leg then it is called as an illusoro ring fixator where will you use illusoro ring fixators and external fixators they are used in case of open fractures where if you put a foreign body or an implant inside the bone or on top of the bone it can give rise to infection so till the soft tissue settles down we use what is called an external fixator illusoro is also used in case of infections and in non unions remember that it's not a femoral fracture because uh, it is spanning the knee and going down to the tibia which may be unnecessary for a femoral fracture so the correct answer in this case is a periarticular fracture with a spanning external fixator i hope you guys got this question correct now what is the choice of treatment for a distal fibula fracture with a medial medullus fracture so when students were recalling and receiving seeing the chats and messages um people are little confused about it but i think it basically meant a bimedullar fracture if you have a distal fibula fracture and a medial medullus fracture it is called a bimedullar fracture what is the synonym or another name for bimedullar named fracture for it it is also called as pots fracture pots fracture this fracture has to always be fixed if you have a medial medullus and a distal fibula fracture you have to always fix this so you basically do a neurological assessment and then do an open reduction internal fixation of these fractures that is the definitive and the proper treatment for these kind of fractures by medullar fractures however if there is an isolated fibula fracture so this is the fibula right and if there is an isolated fibula fracture somewhere proximal third or middle third of the fibula it can be managed conservatively and you must always remember that the common peroneal wraps around the neck of the fibula and therefore it can be in affected there during the injuries of the proximal third of the fibula so proximal third and middle third of fibula fractures can be managed conservatively whereas distal third fractures of the fibula along with the medial medullus fracture always requires open reduction and internal fixation i hope you got this question right as well now they sh- uh, they probably showed a picture of an um, for of an immature shoulder joint and they asked uh, if the patient falls i'm sorry about this question i think the correct question was if they falls directly on the shoulder what a uh, bone is fractured is what they asked right so it doesn't matter how the patient falls the most common bone to be injured or fractured in the body is the clavicle so you should have marked the clavicle as the right answer other bones can be fractured as well but the clavicle is the most common bone to be fractured in the body now then they showed a picture of a hand with multiple lytic lesions there is a controversy about what the picture exactly was but most uh, most students seem to be talking about uh, lytic lesion right you can see multiple lytic lesions in the in the hands when you see multiple lytic lesions you must be very careful because i have already is told you in a previous video that the most common condition if you have multiple lytic lesions in the hand is enchondromas so first you must think of enchondromas but then here you have uh, lytic lesions which are clear without any matrix changes without any chondrogenic or osteogenic uh, oste- ossification or popcorn cal- calcification this most probably looks like a brown tumor brown tumor upper, uh, occurs in which condition it occurs in hyperparathyroidism where um, because of increased parathyroid activity there is a lysis of the bone there and uh, bec- and the uh, blood gets deposited and hemosiderin gets deposited and there and therefore it appears brown in color and therefore it is called as brown tumor so probably the answer was brown tumor it depends on what you guys saw on the x ray there but uh, it could could be also multiple enchondromas so, so i have an image here which shows multiple enchondromas in the uh, hand so this is also called as what is this called as olier's disease olier's disease then you also have another entity along uh, with multiple enchondromas that is called as marfuse's disease which is associated with hemangiomas and phleboliths phleboliths right and so you must know these two conditions olier's disease and phleboliths olier's disease has about 30 to 40% conversion to malignancy but uh, marfuse's disease has a 100% chance of conversion of malignancy of one of the tumors so you must remember this the next question uh, was uh, most common complication of unreduced radial head dislocation i'm not sure if this is a radial head fracture or a radial head dislocation but you must remember that in the elbow <coughs> so if this is the distal uh, humerus and then you have the olecranon here and then you have the radial uh, head here if there is an injury to this side the medial side the elbow moves 
the, or the forearm moves medially. If there is an injury on the lateral side, the elbow moves laterally. V L for valgus, right? V A L L for valgus. That is the distal part of the joint moves laterally. You must remember this. And this is varus. So basically, anything that happens to the radial head, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, dislocation or fracture. If it is a fracture, it goes into probably a malunion because radial head unites well. What goes into a non-union is a lateral condyle, lateral condyle humerus. The one that goes into non-union in the uh, humerus or distal humerus is the lateral condyle fracture. It will also cause valgus. So anything that happens on the lateral side will cause a valgus, L for uh, lateral and valgus, L for valgus. So if there is a medial sided problem, it causes a varus. So where do you get cubitus varus most commonly? You get it in a malunited supracondylar fracture. Malunited supracondylar humerus fracture is the most common. It's called gunstock deformity. So the arm is like this and the forearm is like this. This is called the gunstock deformity. And then um, uh, in the lateral side, of course, you can have lateral condyle fracture is the most common one which causes a problem on the lateral side. It goes into non-union and cubitus valgus. So these are things you must remember. So when the arm goes into valgus, so if this is the arm and this is the forearm, if it goes into severe valgus, the ulnar nerve gets stretched behind the, the ulnar nerve gets stretched behind the medial epicondyle and it can cause tardy ulnar nerve palsy. What is it called? It is called tardy, tardy ulnar nerve palsy. It's called tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So remember these things very, very simple. I have actually discussed this in detail in another video, which I can link up for you. So please take a look at that and you should understand about distal humerus and the cubitus vargus and valgus deformities, very commonly asked question. You should be able to get this right. Okay. So with that, uh, thank you for hearing me out. And those are the questions in the uh, NEET PG exam that uh, came up. If I have missed any questions, please get back to me. I will get back to you with the answers. Thank you very much.